Oh, man. Well, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, it's good to come and bring the word of God again. Um, just to let you know, I'm preaching from home. And this isn't just because the church was particularly cold or anything like that. When I got the news that the heating wasn't on, I decided to come home. Uh, no, unfortunately, uh, Zachary had not feeling very well, and so he's gone for a test. So we're self-isolating at the moment. Um, so, yeah, just praying that this uh, technology works well and that we can uh, receive. So I'm sure I'll receive a message in a moment if it's not working. Um, so I presume for now it is. Um, this morning I want to speak from the book of Ephesians. Um, it's something I've been reading recently uh, in my daily reading. Um, at the beginning of the year, I started off on a plan with a few people, and we're nearly getting to the end of the year. Um, and it's been great to read through the whole scripture in the year and recently reading the book of Ephesians. If you do want to uh, join us, I'm already looking at a plan for next year um, where I'm going to be doing it in chronological order. So if you do want to join a reading plan with others on new version for next year, then do let me know and we can add you on that. But I'm going to read from the book of Ephesians today. So one of the things um, I'm thinking about when I read a Bible a book or a letter or anything like that is is how to do it and often when a few techniques that I learn is that when you're reading a book one of the good things to do is to give it kind of a, a, a subheading because obviously you've got Paul's letter to the book to the sorry the letter of Paul to the Ephesians um, and I was thinking well what's the subheading like you do in many films or anything like that and for me the subheading of the book of Ephesians is God's plan of salvation God's plan of salvation. Uh, some might even call it the gospel of Paul because he outlines the gospel so clearly in this epistle. But also when you're studying a book, a good technique also is to look for a key verse that summarizes um, the, the scripture, the whole book, um, or pivotal verses in that. And for me, there's a pivotal verse in chapter 4, verse 1. So I'll give you a moment. If you haven't got your Bibles yet, you can grab them and turn with me because we're going to read some of the scriptures today. So hopefully you can read along with me. And so I'm going to read in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So whenever, again, we're reading the scripture, one thing you want to look out for is the word therefore. And if you ever read therefore, you ask, what is the therefore, therefore? Um, because it means that something has been said that we need to respond to. And so Paul is saying, because of what I've just said, I'm now going to urge you to walk in a particular way according to the calling which you have been called. So there's two key things there. Um, there's a calling that is upon our lives. And I spoke about this uh, recently. And I'm going to go over some of that a little bit again today. Um, but also uh, to understand that there is a way that we outwork the calling of God. Okay, so I'm going to um, start by just starting at the beginning. Because as I said, what is the therefore? Therefore, Paul laid down a foundation before this. And in terms of the gospel, one of the first things we think about with the gospel is, is what happened? Why did we need Jesus? Why? What happened that we needed salvation? Um, and so the, this word is for the church, and so the question is, how did the church get here? So this is a bit of a challenge, preaching with no one uh, in front of me, not recorded or anything, but we'll keep going. Um, when we think about the past, it's important that we don't just dwell on the past, looking always at the past. But the trouble is, if we don't think about the past, we can forget where we've come from. We can forget what things were like uh, before we became a Christian, what our life was like. And I've been a Christian now for 30 years, and even then, I, I came to faith as a 13-year-old. And I can, so it's really hard to understand what was my heart like, what was my life like before then, um, before God came into my life. But for many of us, that might be different, and we can very much remember what life is like without God. Um, but there are some things in Ephesians that Paul particularly hits home to say, this is what you were saved from. 
And so we can see this, uh, particularly at the beginning of chapter 2, we see it. And Paul writes, and you were dead in trespasses and sins. So, again, this is who we were. You were dead. You were dead. And dead in trespass and sin. There was just sin that caused that death in you. He said, you were following the course of the world and the, following the prince of the power of the air. So this is the way that we were walking. We were walking just like everyone else, just swimming in the same stream, going in the same direction, the course of the world. But we must recognize that there is a power that is at work, contrary to God, in the world. And that is described here as the prince of the power of the air. And so whoever is not God's is following that power. And so we must remember that. And then it says... Um, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So again, there's a power and there's a spirit that is at work. And this is a spirit of disobedience, a spirit of rebellion, a spirit of evil. And so when we look at the things of the world, it's not just simple things, um, but there's actually a spiritual dimension that's going on. And we were under that spirit. We were being led by that spirit um, in that same heart of rebellion, disobedience and selfishness. Uh, and then it goes on to say, among whom we all once lived, so no one's um, any exception to that, but we lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And so, again, we see that so much in today's society, that we're living after the passions of the flesh, the desires of the body and the mind. We just think, if we want it, we'll do it. Who can stop me? I've got rights. And when we want something, we just do it. We don't like to deny ourselves. And that is the spirit of this age. Um, and we were also, as it said, children of wrath. We were under God's wrath. So this kind of, very quickly, I want to just encapsulate, this is the state that we were. This was the problem that we had. And this is why we needed salvation. We were separated from God under his wrath and needed his salvation. And so the encouragement then comes. And I always love these, I call them the big butts of the Bible. And it says in verse 4, but God, but God. So God didn't just leave us in that position. It says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. So God loved us. Again, we read in John 3, 16, God so loved the world. Because of his great love, he poured out mercy upon us. And it says, he loved us even when we were dead. In our trespasses, he's made us alive together with Christ. Christ, And so he loved us so much that he's made us alive. We were dead in sin, but we have been made alive in Christ. Going back a bit further in chapter 1, again we read in verse 3, he's blessed, he says, who is in the second half, I'll read it all actually, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. In the heavenly places so as we're made alive in christ we get the spiritual blessing in the heavenly places it says that he has chosen us before the foundation of the world um and that he has adopted us he has redeemed us that he has forgiven our sins he has cleansed us so again we think what we were and then because of god's mercy when we respond to his mercy by faith we receive this great promise of spiritual blessing uh, into his family, a child of God with the inheritance of Christ through with redemption, with blessings, with forgiveness, with cleansing. This is what you receive when you come to Christ. And so all of that is to take us to the place where Paul says, I therefore urge you, because of all this, because of who you are, because of of what Christ has done. I therefore urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And so there's a couple of things, therefore, in that, that, that verse that I want to unlock a little bit more. And so first of all, there is a calling. So recognizing there is a calling on the church and there is a calling on your life. If you are in the church today, then that calling is for you. There is no exception. There is no first and second class citizens or second class calling everyone is called 
to the same calling in Christ. There is no exception and there is no excuse. So we are called to the same thing. So I want to just explain again, just from Ephesians, what those callings were. So the first one is in chapter 1, verse 4. And he says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, of the world that we should be homely, holy and blameless before him. We should be holy and blameless before him. That is his plan. That is the calling on your life to be holy and blameless before him. Um, he also then says in chapter 2, verse 10, it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So his purpose as well is that there are good works that he has prepared before the foundation of the world for us to do. So part of the calling is to do the works of God. Moving on to verse 22 of chapter 2, it says, In him you also are being built together. So this is us as a church being built together in, into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So the reality is, again, we have a purpose to be the dwelling place of God on this earth. We remember in the Old Testament, God would have a temple where the people would uh, come and worship him and his spirit would dwell in the tabernacle, in the temple, but then that was destroyed. And it was destroyed because it was no longer needed because the spirit of God would no longer dwell in buildings, um, but it would dwell in the life of the church and his people. And so our call is to be the dwelling place of God. And I mentioned this one a couple of weeks ago in chapter 3, uh, verse 10. It says, um, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So again, our calling is to uh, declare, to testify, to just display the manifold wisdom and might of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Uh, I mentioned a few weeks ago that, again, these heavenly places, they're watching on, they're, they're watching us, um, and the way we live and what we do declares God's truth, his plan of salvation being outworked through us. Um, and the reason, so we've got the call, We've got that part of that verse that says the calling to which you have been called. That is our call, to do the works of God, to be the dwelling place of God, to be holy before God, and to display God's plan of salvation to everyone. But the thing is with God's call, it can only be outworked if we walk in a manner worthy. Because if we do not walk in a manner worthy, he will not be glorified. If we do not follow him in his, by faith, receiving his grace, receiving his mercy, but also then walking in his ways, then it will not display his glory. And so his plan will not be outworked. And so there is a manner in which we are called to walk. And so we read this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. And it says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So when I read this, it makes me think about the, the fruit of the spirit. You read that in Galatians. I always try to quote it, but then I get about the first five and then I forget the last few, um, love, joy, peace, and I say, etc. Um, and so these characteristics, these attributes of the spirit need to be outworked in our life. Humility and gentleness, patience, love, unity, peace. These are real key things. And I think the key ones that I see through the book of Ephesians is love. Now, we read that elsewhere in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul says, if we do so many things, if we give our bodies to be burned, if we give all we have to the poor, if we do this, 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 if whatever it is we're doing, if we don't have love, we're nothing. It's just pointless. And this aspect of love needs to underpin everything we're doing. It needs to be the motivation of your life to love others and to love God. 
but it also says about unity because again our unity is a declaration of who god is he is one three in one father son holy spirit they are one and so if we are to uh, declare the truth of god to the world we also need to be unified and if we're not we're not declaring this properly and so unity is so important and i want to encourage you brothers and sisters in christ that we need to fight for unity we need to have it as such an important thing and often we can place um, unity beneath other things and so we say well it's more important that we do this or we do that but if we're moving forward without unity then that's not going to be glorifying to god and the last thing there was submission it doesn't mention it here but it mentions it elsewhere in ephesians we maintain unity through the submission to one another not seeking our own rights our own uh, plans and we just submit to one another and, and follow christ leading um, it says then later on in verse 17 of chapter 4, it says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So how are we to live? We are to live unlike the Gentiles. Now, when we say Gentiles in this context, what it's talking about is those who do not belong to Christ, those who are not Christ outside of the faith. So obviously in this day you had the Jews and the Gentiles and the Gentiles would be seen as the, those who are not God's people. And so obviously they would live in a way that was not according to the purposes of God. And so today you're called not to live as the world lives, as those who are not God's. And so your calling is to live as a child of God, not as a child of the world. And there's a reason for this and it, encapsulates this i think in verse 14 so i hope you're keeping with me as i jump around these scriptures but it's really important to see this overview and he says so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning by craftiness in deceitful schemes because again when we follow the way of the world when we follow the wisdom of the world we're going to be people who are tossed to and fro by the wind we're not going to be anchored. We're not going to be grounded in Christ. We're not going to be wise in him. But we're going to be trying to um, just live according to the wisdom of the world. I think the problem is when you try and live according to the wisdom of the world, what you're living by are half-truths, broken uh, statements. And so it's never going to add up to, to life because it can't. Only God's way can add up to life. And so when we mix and match, when we take a bit of the philosophy of the world, we're never going to add up uh, to the life that God wants. And so there is this calling upon you to live in a way, to have these attributes, um, to, to not walk in this world. But again, if you read this scripture, uh, there's always a scripture that says, be holy as I am holy. In, in chapter 5, it says... <clears throat> Um, be imitators of God. And it's like, how difficult is that? If I tell you, just go away, be like God. How can you do that? You can't do that. I cannot do that. I, have, I can try as, as much as I like with all my resources, all my strength, all my heart. But I know I cannot live up to that standard of calling. And this was always the point when God gave the law to the people of Israel. The point was never that they fulfilled the law but they knew that they needed the grace of God to live. And so we need this grace. And so when we are called to live in this way, it's also to realize that God will equip us to live in this way. And so we read this in chapter 3, verse 16. It says, that according to the riches of his glory. Actually, I'm going to start in 14 and read this whole passage. It says, for this reason... I bow my knees before the Father, who, from whom every family on heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
This is so important. And you need to grasp this, because if we do not grasp this, we have no hope. Because God can do all these things. Salvation is brilliant. Uh, and God can bring us into this place where we were something, but now we are something. But if we do not continue in this walk, what we call sanctification, then we will not be able to do the work of God. And so some key things it says, it says that we can be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in your inner being. That through uh, our response to God, he will give us the Holy Spirit who will come into our inner being and give us strength. And so when you're faced with these things where you have weakness and you cannot do it, God will give you strength to do it by his spirit. But how do we do this? It says that Christ may dwell in our hearts. So Christ comes and dwells in us, and his spirit dwelling in us, but that we are grounded in love. Again, that love is the root of all this, that we are grounded in love, love for God, love for others, and we're moving in that. Um, and it says later in verse 19 that we may know the love of Christ. Because, again, if you do not know the love of Christ, you will be operating out of brokenness. You will be operating for approval. You need to know his love that just melts you, that makes you so secure that you you're, you now are free to love others. Because when we're not enveloped in love, it's always going to be about trying harder, doing better, um, trying to please, and trying to uh, make to receive affirmation from others where you say, no, if you know the love of God, then you will be filled with all the fullness of God. And so, again, I want to encourage you, if you will be filled with God, you need to spend time with him, abiding in him, as we've talked about in the past, throughout the year, um, abiding in Christ, that his love is made perfect in you. Only then can we fulfill the purpose of God. It goes on in... in chapter 14, and it talks about the gifts that are also given. Because, again, we receive that from God, but we also receive from one another. And God has placed us in the church for a purpose. Because, again, if we're to display his glory and his unity, we need to work with one another and support one another. No man or woman is an island that they can do this on their own. And so, again, he says in chapter 4, verse 11, says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. And so this idea again that to grow strong so that we're not, not tossed to and fro, we have to exercise the gifts that God has given us to support one another. So again, the body of Christ will be weak when the body of Christ is not operating in the gifts that is given to them. We need to operate in those gifts to love and serve one another, that we might encourage one another, build one another up, and that we might we might achieve, uh, what does it say, maturity in Christ. And so we have the work of God to strengthen us. We have the work of the church to encourage us, and but we also have personal responsibility because everyone else can do these things, but there will become a moment, there will come a time, and you have to choose. You have to choose to lay aside the world and follow God. And it says this again in verse chapter 4, verse 22. It says, put off your old self. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and it's corrupt thought uh, through deceitful desires. So we have to put this off. It's like taking off a coat, discarding something, and saying this is no longer relevant. This is no longer valid. This is no longer who I am. I need to take it off and discard it and say this is no longer part of me. But then it says to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Your mind needs renewing. Because, again, you were something... You used to think a certain way. You were led by the world, the prince of the power of the air. You were used to being disobedient uh, and turning against God. And so you need to renew your mind. And that is done. The way we do that is it says in verse 24, 
to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So again, it's realizing there's a new reality you've been brought into. You are a new creation in Christ. All the things I mentioned earlier, you are forgiven, that you are cleansed, that you are redeemed, you are chosen, you are loved by him. Renew your minds in the truth. We need to do this. And so there are ways we do this. So in verse 27, it says, um, give no opportunity to the devil. We are not going to renew our minds in Christ. We are not going to outwork our new identity if we keep living the way we used to live, if we keep doing the things we used to do. We need to realize, where am I giving an opportunity for the devil? I don't know about you, if you've ever in your home got up in the morning and realized you've left the door unlocked, the back door or something like that, or even maybe in the summer, you've left the door wide open. Praise God, hopefully you survive that, that night. Um, but it's like that, that when we do certain things that are, are contrary to the will of God, it's like leaving the door unlocked. It's like leaving the door open, open for someone to come in and, and steal from us and disrupt us. And so we wouldn't be that foolish intentionally in our own house, but we can be often that foolish when it comes to our own life that we're leaving the door open for the enemy. And so do the things which are good. Um, I always remember there was um, a sketch that went around a few years ago of a, of a counselling session. And, and so someone went in for the counselling and the counsellor just said, okay. And they said their problem and the counsellor just said, stop it. And they said, was, was that it? And, and they kept talking. They said, just stop it. And there is the reality that sometimes in life, there are things we're doing, and it's just stop it. We've just got to stop and say, we're not going to do that anymore. I'm going to be different. That's what repentance is. Say, no more. I'm going to stop. And again, it's not about our will. It's about the strengthening of Christ. It's about the, the support of the church that will help us in that. But ultimately, there needs to be a decision in our hearts to say, I'm going to turn from this thing and do it no more. Chapter 5, verse 4 says, let there be no filthiness, nor foolishness, talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. And this really spoke to me because, again, it's not just say, don't do things, but it's saying replace those things with things that are good, the things you were doing before. So, again, if we just stop uh, trying to swear or something like that, then that won't be enough, but replace the words of your mouth with thanksgiving, something positive. And so, again, it's in... It says elsewhere, let him who stole steal no more, but make things with his hands. So again, it's not just like stop stealing, but it's like actually do something good and contribute to society. In verse 7 of chapter 5, it says, therefore do not become partners with them. It's talking about those who are of the world. And again, often we partner ourselves with the wrong people, and that will bring us down. So again, God is saying, you partner with me. With me in your heart, I dwell in you. You partner with those in the church. You partner with those who are the children of God. And you they are the ones who will help you through that. Now, obviously, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We don't partner unrighteously with those in the world because they will bring, it, bring us down. And, and I see this again and again, where people think they are the exception to the rule, where they think that, oh, no, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. I can bring this person with me. But the reality is 99% of the time, I see the opposite to be the truth, where the per other person, the unrighteous person, drags them down into the world. So do not uh, partner with the unrighteous. And then in the book, uh, in chapter 6, at the very end, and we're probably very familiar with this passage, where it talks about the armor of God in verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And this is kind of the summary of this, that you get to the end. You get to this place where all this is done, and then it says, just stand. Having done all, just stand. Because, again, the reality is we don't have to keep scrapping and fighting, but the victory is won in Christ. He has overcome sin. He has overcome death. He has defeated the grave. And we need to stand in the reality of what he has done. Because if we do, if we stand, if we listen, if we wait on him, then he will lead us in righteousness. 
And so my question as we finish here is how will you respond to this gospel? And you might be a, a completely different uh, stage in your life as someone sitting even right next to you. But the reality is you might be at that place where I described at the beginning, where you're at that place before Christ, where you're saying, actually, I didn't realize I was lost. I didn't realize I was following the world. But maybe today God has revealed that to you. And I encourage you to take that moment to say, God, I respond to you and I want to receive you into my life and follow you. But maybe you've been walking with God, but haven't been walking in a manner that is worthy of that calling. And I encourage you this morning to repent, to say, I'm going to put off those things. They are no more. I'm stopping it. But to recognize you need to abide yourself in God. Let him abide in you, let his spirit work through you, that you might then know the fullness of God in your life because of his love for you. And then walk, put on these things, put on, like I said at the very beginning, reading the scriptures. I know we've talked about that in the past few weeks, but it changes you. Doing those things which are positive, uh, affirming in God, righteous, and then follow him and walk according to that, that we might fulfill the purposes of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have saved us. I thank you that you have taken us out of that, that miry pit, the, the place of darkness, and you've brought us by your grace and mercy into wonderful light. And I just thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness, for your cleansing, and that we get to be a part of your plan. What a privilege it is to, to be a child of God, to serve you in this way. And I pray that we as a people will glorify you. We will put away the old man, the old self, the old ways, and we will put on this new way, the new self, and we will follow you, that you might be glorified and your plan of salvation might be outworked on this earth. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Daniel, for that word. It was amazing, encouraging, challenging. We're going to respond by singing King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes. We're going to praise the Father. We're going to praise the Son, God of glory, majesty, King of kings. In the darkness we were waiting with our hope, with our light till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the
Before we close, just some notices. Um, the Christmas cards are here, so if you are here in the building, please feel free to take some. Don't forget the envelopes um, you can deliver to your street. If um, anyone here or not here uh, is able to deliver stuff to the local homes, if you could just liaise with me, that'd be great, just so that we can cover as many homes as we can. Um, so they're available at the back, and you can also collect some in the week. Um, if you're able to get in the building, obviously Monday or Tuesday, um, but also when the cafe's open, so please feel free to take some. Um, prayer tonight, 7 o'clock. Um, the Christmas program is on the email, um, which is next Sunday evening, 6 o'clock is our carol service. Um, so, but other than that, the other details are on there. So other than, I think let's just commit this time to the Lord and then we're close. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love, Lord, that you have for us. And may we be those that are your examples of love in our, in our families, in our communities. Lord, as we go about our days, Lord, we just pray for your hand upon all that we do. Lord, we, we just thank you for who you are. And we just commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.